Live from the archipelago of last years, this is Derail the Trains of Thought. Welcome to episode 124 of Derailed Trains of Thoughts, your premier podcast on storytelling for the consumer and creator. And my name is Timothy Deal. My name is Nick Hayden. And we're coming to you from a very interesting um, landmass. Yeah, we've we've is... been visiting a lot of islands. It feels like we've been traveling through time. Yeah, and sometimes I feel like we're still traveling through time. Yeah, it's... Like, it's bizarre. Like a minute ago, one island we visited was like colonial America time, and another one we're bumping into like Abraham Lincoln. It's kind of wild. Yeah, it's it's kind of cool, but a little disorienting. It is, and I'm pretty sure I saw Rudolph pass overhead a minute ago. I'm so confused right now. Yeah, I'm sure our listeners are too. But anyway, Merry Christmas, Nick. Merry Christmas, Tim. This is early December as we were recording this. We're just uh, slowly getting into uh, the Christmas mode, the Christmas spirit. Yes. It's like, oh, it's December. Time for Christmas. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I hope you folks enjoyed our sidetrack. November was very busy for both of us. So why was it busy, Tim? Well, I was in a play. So I like, don't... was it three weekends? Uh, no, it was just two weekends. Yeah. But whenever you're in a play, it kind of takes over your life for a period of time. Mm-hmm. It was a very good play. Well, thank we'll, you. We'll, we'll probably talk about it later. I'm glad you enjoyed it. But what, what were you busy with? Teaching. Did I, well, teaching what obviously. Obviously, in November, but there but, was oh, obviously there were numerous birthdays in my family and Thanksgiving <laughs> and things like that. Because Phil had his birthday and my nephew Lex had his birthday and I had my birthday all within three days of each other and Thanksgiving was between them. Oh, happy birthday! Yeah, thank you. <laughs> and didn't you also have some sort of play or project you were doing with your class? Well, yeah, we were, well, the school, each class paints these giant Christmas cards that go out at Pixlr Lake. And then well, I also made a film for Advent Service, which was actually performed just last night. Okay. Um, the film was performed last night? Well, you, you third, fourth, it? and fifth grade all do something for Advent all in one service. Okay. So like third graders read their thing, fourth grader read their thing. We showed our video. Everyone played music. Ah, uh, okay. It's a whole half hour Four program or five minute thing program thing. okay yeah. and you went all multimedia yeah I would be yeah, I'm like my fifth graders are they're a lot of fun but they're not this sort of like to go on stage and just read rehearse lines okay yeah and I'm not really either <laughs> so I'm like uh, I do this video thing sometimes let's have fun with it and it, it, it went well my robotics team that we've we've been practicing since Labor Day had their competition on the 19th I mean it was like it was just a crazy couple of weeks. Like everything, like every couple of days, there's some big project due or done or finishing up, and so I'm I'm feeling pretty free actually right now. Cool. Well, congratulations on all your accomplishments. Well, mostly my students, but yes, I was there making them do it. <laughs> making, <laughs> making, <laughs> they accomplished much because I made them. <laughs> Fun. Okay, well, with uh, preliminary pleasantries done, <laughs> it's time to really f- get into the meat of this do fight. It. Just do it. Thank you, Shia LaBeouf. Yes. Uh, but uh, the rest of the podcast is where we get into some fun discussions about storytelling, and that will begin with Story School. For Story School today, we're dipping our toes back into the philosophical grounds. I love philosophical grounds. (laughs) They make good coffee. Mm. (laughs) Mmm. (laughs) Mmm. Philosophical. (laughs) Uh, But yes, we love uh, getting deep about our storytelling ideas sometimes. And this one, uh, the concept, I guess, is the transience of stories. Or maybe we should just say how stories interact with time. Time. Time is always interesting. Time is my nemesis. Mm. Um, but So, Tim, we were thinking the part of this partly because the entire medium of a play, you see it and it's gone. Yeah. I mean, nowadays you can record it and whatever, but that's not really what it's meant for, even. True. I mean, it's... Since I was just in a play, yeah, yeah, I've had some fresh thoughts about this because it's a fascinating thing because you spend weeks and weeks, yeah, about I'll, two about two months in practice, in a lot of hours, yeah, in rehearsal trying to create this thing that doesn't fully exist 
for a long time. I mean, it, there's a lot of, especially this particular play. So I guess we didn't actually say the play was Great Expectations, an adaptation of Charles Dickens' novel. It involved, uh, there was about eight of us in the cast that played multiple roles. Multiple roles, which is really cool. And we moved the stage around, or we should say, we, we moved the stage. <laughs> Move the stage, like one of those Les Mis turning. Yeah, yeah. We, we wish. No, we moved the furniture all around the stage, and there were walls that we moved into place to kind of simulate different locations and things like that. Basically, just you change a costume, and that would be, or not, not entirely costume, you throw on a, a jacket and a cravat or something, yeah. and that's a different character than when you're just the narrator. And Stuff like that. But there was a lot. It took a long time of figuring out just the logistics of where you're going to be and when you move such and such thing and when you put on this costume and stuff like that, in addition to acting. Yes. And so it's an interesting art form in that it takes a while. You're basically creating a moment of time where you are guiding your audience through the story by moving yourself around, moving the props around, and basically kind of recreating these scenes on stage. And it's never the same. It's never quite the same. I mean, hopefully we don't have like major mistakes. Yeah, or like we, sim- very similar, but you got different audience energy. You got right, different, right. Yeah. Like there were definitely some audiences that like, there are some jokes that we knew were very much targeted towards theater people. Mm-hmm. And the, the nights we had the theater audience, we got some of the best responses. I mean, I think the audience in general enjoyed it a lot. But what I mean is sometimes a part would get a bigger laugh than, yeah. other, than other nights, which is fine. That's just kind of the nature of, of theater. See our theater episode, episode 94-ish, somewhere around there, uh, where we had our director from All for One Productions who directed Great Expectations, but she was on our podcast and talked all about theater. But yeah, it's it's a substantial investment of time for something that is then over. Yeah, it just... We, we like did the it grass. For, yeah, <laughs> we did it two weekends, and then it's just all done. Done, and you can't ever really see it again. No, I mean, in part because you we're really like by copyright, not really allowed to record it. Yeah, we can take pictures. We yeah. have some very nice pictures that we're taking of everyone in costume, and you know, some dramatic pictures of the different scenes and things like that. But it's never going to be quite that again, which is something interesting. I mean, the idea that stories can capture a moment of time and sometimes experiencing a story. I mean, that's a very extreme example, but I think experiencing stories in some ways can be a part of Cairo. How does it? Kairos? Kairos time. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Kairos time being this sort of conception of time that's like outside of our normal conception of time. I I feel like that definition wound in on itself. It was timey-wimey. It it was timey-wimey. But like, so the idea is Kronos time is what's typical Western American follows you get there at five till ten and da 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 yeah. kairos is more the it's disconnected from the measurements of time is that what kind of what you're saying yeah, yeah yeah and i think when you're lost in a story you can kind of enter that that phase i mean other examples of kairos time could include meditation prayer mm-hmm. just getting lost in looking at a, a conversation a probably yeah, yeah conversation anything where you're not constantly aware of the time and it's passing I, what the, the kind of the the scientific is like what is it when you're in flow is that the have you heard that term where it's like you just kind of disconnect from time and you just get lost and it's like oh it's an hour later yeah 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 i, I don't know if i've heard it as a scientific term before but yes there's that some idea. brain state they call it and i think it's flow or flux or something like that yeah okay okay someone else can correct me but. yeah well and i think stories can inhabit that mode in your you're exploring arts. You're off on an adventure to a distant world or, or what have yeah, you. You're lost in, it's no longer, do you use stage play? It's no longer lost in, oh, there's those people that I know pretending to be. It's suddenly like, no, they are those people for that. For that period of time, period of time. While, while you're watching that scene. Yeah. Ideally, of Ideally, course. Yeah. <laughs> or, or, or at least they're both. Mm, yeah. You know, most times when the play is good, you're not like, oh, he's pretending to be Pip. You know, right. Like, oh, it's Pip talking, and here's this other guy doing this Hamlet thing. Right, right. Yeah. So that's an interesting phenomenon. I think, again, plays is one of the biggest areas you see this, but I think there's something to the way we interact with stories and how we seek them out that also ties into this. I was thinking today, we can kind of interact with stories in the same way that we interact with 
time itself and mm-hmm. kind of this past, present, and future sort of thing. Okay. Like past interaction with stories is very nostalgic. Yes. Focused. Like, remember when, and wasn't it funny when we first saw, yeah. Yeah. The, the best, the first time I saw this. And then, like, and you're like, children, you must watch this because when I was the first saw it, it was wonderful. And they watch it. They're like, okay, what, dad? Um, <laughs> I take it you've experienced this? No, not actually not as much as I thought. No, except Star Wars. They're like, yeah, whatever. <laughs> uh, except Mercy. Mercy likes Star Wars. But then sometimes, like we're showing Doctor Who, they're like, Dad, we need to watch more of this thing. I'm like, yes. <laughs> um, yes. And the nostalgia is, a lot of it, it goes back to that experience of like, I experienced this. Like, if there was a movie you saw in the theater as a kid, mm-hmm. you probably remember distinctly what it was like to see it in the theater. Yep. We've had the story on here about Jurassic Park, my brother, you know, the stuff like that. Yeah, exactly. Then future interaction with stories is kind of the hype factor. It's coming. The trailer is like, ooh, what is this going to be? It's like, oh, I'm going to get to experience this at some point. And not knowing what, knowing that it's something but not all the details, in some ways is very exciting because like you hope to be surprised and wowed yet again mm-hmm. like your nostalgia did right. for you once upon a time. It's interesting though, in our normal day to day lives, some of us are comfortable with examining the past because we're familiar with it. And uh, we're okay with the present because, like, okay, yeah, that's not scary. But the idea is the future is scary. I think it's sometimes when it comes to stories, the future is exciting because, oh, I don't, what's, what's going to happen? This could be cool. But the present is actually the scary part, <laughs> which is interesting because, I mean, as an audience person, there's that risk of I'm going to try this story and it may or may not be good, yeah, but yeah. Uh, I'm, this is a time investment. Is this going to be worth my time? You know, I've got a lot of Kronos time to <laughs> keep track of. Um, and then for the writer or the creator, it's like, oh my word, this is taking so long to make. <laughs> exactly. Like I've spent hours and it's only a thousand words. <laughs> Whereas like you enjoy brainstorming about the future projects. Oh, I'm going to make that story someday. Oh yeah. And go, oh, yeah. College was full of writers being like, I'm going to write someday. And then, or I wrote this thing back. Well, okay. Actually a lot of writers probably don't look back on their past works that enthusiastically. There's some, there's something like that. There's something like, I know sometimes I look back because I feel like I used to write more and not as much now, which is partly true, but it's also kind of a lie because I've been writing for a long time, so of course it looks like I've written more in the past. Oh, yeah. Because I have. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that's true. But I mean, the whole, like, again, with the consumer thing, like looking through Netflix, there's a yep. billion things to watch. So I'm just going to watch the thing I've watched a million times it, before. Yeah. That's a common occurrence. Interestingly, though, and this is tangentially related, but... In one of my Muppet fan podcasts, yeah. they were talking recently about a TV special that's never probably will never be released commercially called uh, Muppets 30 Year Celebration or something like that. Okay. One of these like Muppet Show Muppets and Sesame Street and Sam and Friends and Fraggle Rock characters and all these Jim Henson productions at the time yeah. were all kind of in one place, kind of a retrospective clip show thing. But anyway, the the hosts were talking about how they had this rec- recorded this thing off TV, and it was fun to watch the commercials and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. And you know, back when they originally f- saw it, like it on rerun on Nickelodeon or something, this would have been the first time they had seen a lot of the old vintage Henson shows that were on the scope yeah. show. And it just reminded me how, in some ways, it's, it's a very older guy thing to say. Oh, it's so easy to get all this stuff online nowadays. Yeah. Kids don't know how good they have it. They can just push a button and watch it. But there is something interesting about like back when how you were exposed to shows just depended on what was at your yeah. library or the video store and what you heard of. Well, and that's, I mean, and I was thinking about that when we were talking about the play and everything is that we're not very comfortable currently with the transients of stories. Yeah. Everything that's made, we must record, keep, back up, you know, make a wiki about and uh, make. And in some ways, it almost it's both good and bad in the sense that like. Hey, we have crept more of the creativity of the world, which is not necessarily a bad thing. But then it's almost like, I don't know. It's like my precious. It's I mean, <laughs> but it's like we, it, it's like it, I guess it's a sort of gluttony in the sense that like we it's ours. We must keep it. We can't lose it. It's part of. And it's hard because on one hand, for instance, like the what well, like Lucas and some other George Lucas and some other people are trying to save like the old early films. Mm-hmm. Is it George Lucas? I think like he's part of it. He's probably one of them. He's he does care about old Pres- you know, preservation. Like what was it? The movie Hugo, if mm. you've seen, or and that's Scorsese. Scorsese, 
you know, talking about old movies, and I think it mentions even that there were all these other movies that we don't have anymore by that same guy. What's the guy's name? You should know. And I oh, the uh, Trip to the Moon Trip guy. Trip to the Moon um, guy. I'll look it up, okay. and I'll recognize it as soon as I see it. But, but this idea that in some ways we're like, oh, we've lost all that stuff. Like, all these movies that were new, and, you know, you almost just want to keep them... Yes. Uh, Melees. George... Melees. M- Melees. See, I, sure. wanted, I wouldn't say Moliere, but I knew that was the French Yeah, I, I, it is a French... I'm probably not saying that right, but Melees, something like that. But is that, is that idea that, on one hand... So it's kind of interesting now, we do it less and less, that idea that you would send something out into the ether, and then it'd just be a one-shot. Like, yeah. nothing's a one-shot anymore. We um, want to re- preserve it and want to have its available conveniently available yeah. for us which i'm not opposed to because i do believe that it's a valuable resource yes. for us to see the artwork of the past yes i i completely agree with that yes but the downside of of archiving all this stuff is you know today as much as any time you go into a used bookstore you'll encounter gobs and gobs of books that you have absolutely no idea if any of them are worth your time or mm-hmm. not because we used to only keep around the stuff that lasted yeah now we keep around Everything. Everything. And so how how can you find anything? I mean, it's interesting when you come across a cult classic, something like, say, The Thief and the Cobbler, yeah, which was this lost film, essentially. The director got carried away with himself, and so the investors took the film away from him, and they kind of they distributed it as an inferior product. But then there was a fan who basically put together a, the best realized version of what this animated movie could be. And that's fascinating yeah. because you feel like this is this lost artwork that, you know, you had to seek out and find. Yeah. You had to put the little extra effort. Well, I mean, it's online, so now anyone can see it. But you get this sense of, like, this is something special. This is something that was rescued. And it's hard to know of all the hundreds of, like, quote-unquote rescued things. I mean, again, I'm sure there's some, like, Bobsy Twin books <laughs> that have long been forgotten that are sitting up in a in a used bookstore somewhere. Yeah. But those were those were a popular kids series at one time. Mm-hmm. It's a bit of a tangent, but it's it's fascinating to me that stories reflect a time period where they were from. And so that they're worth keeping for that reason. Yeah. But, yeah, it's just that double-edged sword. Like, it's good to have those be exposed to things that aren't, my, you know, your time period, so we don't have chronological snobbery. Right. But simultaneously, there's just so much of it now. Yeah. Like, how do you... And and I think the problem is that because we record everything, keep everything, and don't like the transient, that we almost feel like we need to be on top of it all. Yeah. Which is, when the story was just... Again, we all have, I think, examples of, you know, you're just traveling with your friends, and people just... You just make up a story, you know, and then it's just... Sure. Gone. But you're like, remember, and you have that, like the past version, you know, the uh-huh. nostalgia about that. And you can't recap. The hardest thing about nostalgia and stories is that you want to recapture that thing. Right. And that, I guess, from a Christian point of view, that ache is supposed to point us to the actual final good ending we'll get for, for this story, the real story we're living. Yeah. And there is something, too, about being satisfied with what you are given in the moment. Mm-hmm. I remember a, there's a, a part in Paralandra where soon after Ransom arrives at, on this foreign planet, mm-hmm. he finds this fruit that he that he eats. And kept, it's, this kept in my mind for a long time, yeah. And it's a delicious, delectable fruit, and it's very it's very satisfying, very filling. And he's after he finishes it, Ransom is he has a certain urge to eat another one. Yeah, because yeah. Because why wouldn't you? But then as soon as before he can even I don't know if he grabs it or goes for it or whatever. He's also immediately flicked with a prick of conscience, this feeling that he shouldn't eat another fruit, but that the first fruit was good enough that to continue eating would be would be almost greedy or like ungrateful or something. That everything's beautiful in its time and it was meant for just that time. That moment. That moment. And that's I think a modern struggle more because we have the access to everything. That idea that it's great to watch something, to read something, to enjoy it fully, and then to let it go. Mm. Not, not always, you know, mm-hmm. but I mean, I feel con- I, I feel constantly uh, conflicted about like, oh, I read these great books, I should read them again, but I also have these new books I want to read, and th- how about this thing? And suddenly you're, this is why I'll get, I, am, I know I mentioned on the podcast before, you go into a bookstore, you just start feeling depressed. Yeah. Because you're like, time and stories, you don't have, they don't match up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yep. And so instead I've learned, well, some days I've learned to just enjoy what you're 
reading Mm -hmm. or you're watching or not worry about all the other things. Yeah. I mean, I don't think it's wrong necessarily to reread things occasionally. absolutely not. Like even Lewis, who wrote Paralandra, has been quoted as saying, I've never read a book that uh, I loved that I wouldn't want to read it a second time or something along those lines. And you can relearn things. I mean, you can encounter a story a second or a third or a fourth time and see new things for it. Oh, absolutely. Like, I mean, yeah, I'm not trying to say that we shouldn't reread things, but that that sort of um, being guided too much by nostalgia. Yeah, finding that balance is key. And sometimes you may find when you really think about it, if you've thought about it enough, you may find that you don't need to see it a second time. I mean, you and I have kind of come to that conclusion with Ava, yeah, Neon Genesis Evangelion. We're both like, we saw it once, that was enough. And it was, and it was you know, obviously as much as I've talked about it, probably good that I saw it. Mm for my own processing of what's gone on. I mean, granted, I'm talking about the original series, not necessarily the, the new movies, yeah, which, see. which we do need to see at some point. <laughs> <laughs> but that brings up an, another thing that's, again, tangentially, but I think related to this, yes. that going all the way back to episode 60, when we talk about long-standing stories, you had some new ground th- about this. Yeah, well, I believe so. Just the idea that we don't want stories to die either. It's that not only do we have the capture, but we have to squeeze every last thing out of it, even when it starts... Like we talked a couple of episodes ago, keeps it changes, it jumps to shark. Uh huh. You know, Tarzan's great, so let's write twenty five of them. <laughs> you know, everything's that sort of idea. Like we we want a story to last forever. We like the fact that we have a happy ending, but we're also sometimes sad that it has an ending at all. Yeah. And I think that's a good thing in some cases, in the sense that, like you said, future stories we get excited about because it has all the possibility and none of the fear. Because mm. it's a story. It's not danger. Sure. And I think that idea that there's this excitement, this joy, this this adventure that never ends mm-hmm. resonates with people because it's true. Well, I mean, Disney Plus had some, uh, they've done some ads at least earlier this year with Tom Hiddleston narrating that were basically along these these lines. I mean, how do you justify doing all the remakes and additions that Disney does that their whole thing was like, the stories don't have to end, and they were mm-hmm. showing pictures from you know Mandalorian and Loki and yeah. uh, the Mighty Ducks <laughs> reboot series. Because if we fall in love with certain characters, certain ideas, you want to keep recapturing. I mean, this is the whole Hallmark movie phenomenon mm. that you don't really necessarily want ten movies. You want the same movie again. <laughs> yeah, and uh, you know, I make fun of Hallmarks, but. It's the same thing with Mandalorian. I mean, with yeah. Star Wars, with Marvel movies. You want something new, but you want something the same. It's, I mean, it's in some ways G.K. Chesterton's whole, like, you went off in search of a new land and you found home. Yeah. I mean, that's <laughs> that's basically what we're trying to do all the time. Yeah. Is go on an adventure, discover new land, and make sure it feels just like home. <laughs> yep. And I think we've said similar things on the podcast before, but it's just interesting to put this on a bigger philosophical picture, yeah. portrait of of what is this tendency of humankind to kind of fear the present and fear the new and fear the yeah because we want unexplored but we don't <laughs> yeah we we want the adventure of newness and the familiarity of home mm-hmm. and, and there's think, a certain possessiveness of being able to pos- maintain control over having yeah. that those and, things and even think, in our story in our entertainment yeah and i think it's i mean just as a you know, as a Christian, I think there's a lot of hope in that idea that that means that everyone really is longing for some sort of happy ending, some mm-hmm. sort of, and they lived happily ever after. And not as an ending, but as a... They continued having fun adventures. They continue adventures. Having, fun, yeah, having fun adventures. There were many other things that went on, but we don't have time to talk about those things. Sort right. Of ending. And whenever you hit for that sort of ending in a book, you like, give me more. <laughs> and so sometimes they do. Yeah. And I mean, I remember reading The End of Wheel of Time. And thinking, I could go on more adventures with these people. I mean, it was 14 years, like 20, 14 books, like 20 years of my life. And I'm like... And how many pages are we talking about? Uh, I, yeah, I mean, <laughs> tens of thousands. Not tens of thousands, uh, thousands. Thousands of pages. And, yeah. And you still weren't quite done. <laughs> yeah, it was a good ending, but they were great characters and an interesting world. And so... Yeah. So it does feel like there are good and bad ways you can look at this tendency. And in, I mean, I guess that's true of a lot of human desires. A lot of our desires can be exploited for good or bad ends. I think, and especially when it comes to t- things, you know, related to time, 
in in some ways, it's the good sides that whole eternity is written in the heart of man. Mm. And some of it's like time is the second law of thermodynamics. Everything tends towards disorder. And there's there's a sense of like death involved in time. Mm-hmm. Sorry, I got super philosophical there. <laughs> but I think that's the, that's the issue is that on one hand, it can point us towards truth. On the other hand, we can get wrapped up, my precious, you know, mm-hmm. be like, too little butter spread too much bread. We, we just watch Lord of the Rings, guys. So, <laughs> <laughs> as, as you all know. As you all know. So the quotes are everywhere. But, I mean, I, I guess that is part of the, the paradox of the human experience in yeah. some ways. The fact that the human soul is an internal soul, and yet we are bonded by this very specific time frame that we have called mm-hmm. life. Yeah. That we know there's a beginning and an ending to life, that we're going to die someday, but for the soul, the soul will live on. Yeah. But we don't know, we don't have a conception of eternity yet, except this kind of vague longing yeah. for for uh, the end of the last battle, where the stories go ever on, and each page is better than the one before. Yeah. Further in, further up. Yeah. So I, that's a Narnia reference for those who, who missed it. And we pull out all the bit heavy-hitting Christian author, <laughs> fantasy authors here today. I we're getting George MacDonald, so. Yeah, I, I need to learn my George MacDonald a lot better. He's harder to quote. Yeah, he, he's uh, what I have read of George McDonald. He's much more abstract. He's, I mean, he's very perceptive. Did you ever read uh, Back in Northwind? No, we we want to. We just that again. The fall was madness. Yeah. So January, everyone, is our annual um, book club review. So you hear about at least some of these novels here. Yep. And I I caught up on some old book club books in 2021. So yeah, that'll be fun to talk about next coming up in January. But. I think that's a pretty good. Anything else you want to mention about uh, the transience of stories? I, since December, we're staring at these Christmas trees in these lands we're going by. Uh-huh. It's interesting as far as stories and time. And, I mean, Christmas is a story. Yeah. And it's one of those that, in some ways, we're desperately wanting to capture the spirit of every year. Mm. You know, and we find how many different ways yeah. to try to capture that one thing that's the center of it. It's a moment of time that captures the Christian imagination, mm-hmm. like all the surroundings of the story, the angels, like what was it like in the in the manger or in the stable or the cave or wherever, you know, our Bible scholars will tell us, was it really this? Yeah, or that? Like, there, were only, there weren't, they never said it's three wise. <laughs> they may have come like two years later. Yeah. It's like, okay, 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 whatever. But the point is the poetry of it, the beauty of it. And so we make all these trappings of, and again, like we have the good and bad. You can get lost in having to create the Christmas spirit, but you can also get lost in enjoying the Christmas spirit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And being fascinated and kind of struck by the awe of a single moment in time. And hopefully, yeah, reinvigorated. Because stories at their best reinvigorate that longing, that, that thing that you don't know you want. Yeah. And at worst, makes you just work at all the outside edges trying to get back to it. Mm. Mm-hmm. So, Okay, one more Tolkien reference. Go for it! Don't be a, a Fionor so consumed by the light that you want to imprison it and capture it in your little created carved jewel mm-hmm. um, that you obsess over that and kind of lose the sight of why it was beautiful in the first place. It's got to exist on its own, in its own time, mm-hmm. and then maybe move on so. for now. Yeah. All right. Something to keep in mind around the the Christmas festivities and the New Year's festivities yes. as we approach a, a new year and think what in the world 2022 will bring us. And the chimes ring and, oh, wrong reference. That's, that's Dickens. Yeah. Which is totally fine here. <laughs> yes. All right. Well, that is our story school for today. Hopefully we blew your mind just, just in the right way. <laughs> but now we'll move on into soundtrack. So, I need to apologize to all of her. <laughs> After this very deep, meaningful, <laughs> philosophical discussion, clearly that means you have a deep philosophical soundtrack to share Yes, with us. and very Christmassy as well. Uh-huh. Um, as per normal, I'm like, oh yeah, this is a Christmas episode. I did not think of that for a soundtrack. <laughs> so, I was just thinking the transients of stories, and oddly enough, the first thing I thought of was trying to compare it to video games, not some deep Japanese plot about, you know, VV and life and stuff. But it was the fact that back in the day of the arcade, 
in Fort Wayne and Glenbrook Mall, I would pump chords into the X-Men arcade game. Uh-huh. And at one point, we beat it. I don't know who else was playing with me or whatever, but we beat it. And it gives you some ending stuff. And then it just starts straight over. And I'm like, that was horribly unsatisfying. Like, Because it had no ending. They're like, yeah, I guess I looked it up. Because I was trying to figure out my memory was right. And I guess there are some ending scenes, but then it just starts over. Because I guess because you have quarters and you have, you didn't die. So you can keep playing. But it wasn't hard. It was just the same thing. And it's just like. Are they even make it? More difficult? I don't think so. I think it was just a loop, yeah. at least from my memory. I'm just like, what? That wasn't any fun. I don't have any sort of like, yes, I did it. It just, like, I don't want it to continue on forever. Like, it uh-huh. should have an ending. <laughs> Anyways, that's my memory of it. It's been very many years since we played it, but Wolverine was the best, as always, back in my 90s style. Anyway, so I found from Dwelling of Duels, which we don't usually get songs from there, but sometimes we do, remixed by Snapple Man, this uh, song called Junk Factory. And it's super 90s, super X-Men. It is, indeed. Um, it is the most anti-Christmas sort of. <laughs> well, I guess if you... Not if, anti, but it's it's anti, like, pleasant, snowy. No, th- this is yeah. this is like the kids in the back room going nuts on the, the Nintendo while it, all the adults are just trying to play ping pong yeah. or categories or something. Oh, but... But when I found it, it made me smile. It gave me good memories of back when I would sing chorus in this thing. So here you go, everyone. Today's podcast was brought to you by Brevity, the podcast. Listen now. Well, hey, Nick. Hello, Tim. I'm surprised we're back so fast. That was a really quick sponsor. Yeah, spot. The, the, uh, less is more. Less is more. Less yeah. is more. Yep. I guess they, they subscribe to that anyway. But let's move on. But you should subscribe to it as well. Oh, I guess so. <laughs> Brevity, the podcast. Meanwhile. Uh, it's to the point. I would just hope so, but hang on there, Nick. I know you're getting excited for our next segment. <laughs> it's so fun. But folks, we have a very special Christmas gift for you. Yes. Whether you've been naughty or nice, you deserve this. Well, if you're naughty, this is your punishment. <laughs> but it is your punishment, eh? Yeah. Well, that's right. It, that's Joke's right, on folks. You. <laughs> it is time for pun time. <laughs> Well, Nick, tis the season for some puns. It is the season for some puns. So uh, what's uh, what do you think we'll be punning about tonight? Hmm. Do we do seasonal punning? Have we done seasonal punning? I don't know that we have before. No time like the present. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Nick, you light up my life. 
<laughs> oh boy. I don't know. I really should be stocking up my uh, puns. Mm, that would be that would be um... wrap it up, Tim. Yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah, <laughs> I, I'm just trying to figure out the right way to present this or present this. <laughs> <laughs> that made more sense. It would have made more sense written down, I guess. Got to figure out a better way to put a tag on it. Did you hear about that holy cat? Holy cats? Holy I don't cat. think so. Yeah, no. I call him Santa Claus. <laughs> <laughs> that was a little too obvious. <laughs> That's right. You can cut it. I can cut and wrap it, right? <laughs> Did we already do a wrapping thing? Yeah, technically. <laughs> <laughs> So the other day, I told Janelle there was some precipitation outside, and she was like, oh, is it snow, darling? And I said, no, that's rain, dear. <laughs> ah! <laughs> I actually, I'm like, I, I, got, I had the end of the pun in my head, but I could not figure out a setup for it. <laughs> Man, you get them so fast, you're just blitzing them. <laughs> but really, if it does rain, you should don her a raincoat. <laughs> Yeah, I'll hurry up and dash her to that. What do you think I am, Cupid? <laughs> There's no way I'm working Vix into a pun here. <laughs> <laughs> not, not in good taste. I, I, I'm, I'm fixing for a beating. <laughs> okay, there you go. There you, you go. You, you did it. Yep, I was fixing for a beating. <laughs> so there was this this uh, lady decided to give some spices for Christmas. Okay. The problem is she gave everyone like the same kind. You, you've seen that, that little spice mix called Mrs. Dash. Yeah. So it was for everyone. It was just dash away, dash away, dash away all. <laughs> that was a stretch. Oh, Christmas tree. <laughs> <laughs> Not really a pun. I just want to say it. <laughs> See, I really want to go like full third grader at this point and do like the old like, how many letters are in the alphabet at Christmas? I don't think I know that one. Well, there's 25, but there's no L. Oh, okay. <laughs> I should have known that was where that was going. <laughs> Way to string me along. Well, you need to lighten up. <laughs> one of us has to be the star of this party. Well, aren't you the angel? <laughs> if I just keep needling you, it'll work. <laughs> oh, I'm sure listeners are pining away for something else to listen to. Well, Nick, I hate to keep ribboning you on, but we got to... <laughs> it's not like you had something. I thought I did. <laughs> I'm just trying to shepherd you into uh, something smart. Have you got any more puns? Yes or snow? <laughs> yes or snow. That's cold. Oh, well, Tim, it must be too early to have an epiphany. <laughs> Church calendar pun, everybody. <laughs> wow, what a let's mark this advent. The advent of pun times. Everybody. And the advent of pun times. Yep. <laughs> You don't get wise, man. Fear not. <laughs> do you know why Santa uses the assistance that he does? I do not. Because they're great elfing hands. <laughs> well, let's see. You got any more? This is, I know we're going to cut this down. But. I don't, I think we had a run really good ones there. Yeah, for a little bit. But the problem, yeah, the presents were pretty easy. I uh, really want to get in Excelsior Stadio somehow. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's all we got. Yeah, I think. Pretty soon I'll just frustrated man and start decking the halls. <laughs> Pun times, everybody. Pun times. All right. I'm ready to move on. For our next segment, it is time for another challenge accepted. I know we did this uh, segment not too long ago, but I had an idea for it, and it just seemed fitting since we've been talking about transients and stories and long stories and things you like you kind of vaguely remember. Mm -hmm. uh, seems it's very fitting for talking about Christmas specials and Christmas movies and yes. things like that. Because there's a lot of them. there's some that are classic, some that are like. Once upon a time, I saw something. I saw it. it seems vaguely familiar. Some Jack Frost and. Right, so evil snowman, and so I've picked out about seven here. Nick. Okay, what I'm going to do is play for you an excerpt from uh, a Christmas special or movie, Ooh, okay. and see if you can identify what it is. Okay, um, I'm going to try to do these in, in order of difficulty, but we'll we'll see how it goes here. And this was an interesting challenge, just choosing which ones, because I wanted to pick out ones that were not so the classic obvious ones, like a Charlie Brown Christmas or. Rudolph, but also ones that you might actually recognize, maybe. 
And that would be interesting because I think probably when I was a kid, I watched way more Christmas specials than I have in recent years. Right. Um, and there's some famous Christmas specials that I've never seen. Like yes. Christmas Story. Oh, yeah. I've never actually watched all of A Christmas Story either, which I'm sure some people are shocked yeah, by. Yeah, they, they, they have unsubscribed instantly. <laughs> but, like, I think that's one of those things that you see enough, like, clips of it, and you feel like you, at least in my case, like, I don't feel any desire to actually watch this thing now all the way through. All right. But first off, let's go with this one. I, originally, I was going to come up with, like, multiple choice, but we'll see. Let's see how you do with this first okay, one. See and if I'll, can do this. Okay, here we go. If you need it. Guinea pig is ready. Now, as you know, last night was Christmas Eve when kids hung up their stockings. I hung up mine. And this morning, they opened their presents. But here's the amazing news, folks. Tomorrow, it will be Christmas again. Folks are buying Christmas presents and shopping hey, like hey, crazy. Frog, my kid wants a microphone. I'll give you 50 bucks for yours. Uh, certainly not. This news frog's mic is not for sale. How about 100? You want that wrapped? <laughs> All right. Well, obviously, it's some sort of Muppety thing. Yes. Now, the one they're most familiar with is not Christmas Carol, obviously. I don't believe it's the family Christmas, because I've seen that recently. Mm -hmm. It almost seems like it's like, a, is it a Sesame Street special? It is a Sesame Street special. Okay. I so, think it's all as much as they can get on it. Okay, so you've narrowed down. I will, I will give you a couple options. I'm trying to remember if I've ever watched the Sesame Street Christmas special. Okay. I think you. If I give you some multiple choice, you might still be able to figure it out by okay. process of elimination. But all right, is this Christmas Eve on Sesame Street? Okay. A special Sesame Street Christmas. Okay. Elmo saves Christmas. Okay. Or the Great Santa Claus switch. Now, question: Are those all legitimate titles? Those are all legitimate titles. Okay. Yes. So they they all exist. They all exist. Okay. So, I'm gonna say. Uh, wait. Give me the second one again. I'll just go through them okay. again. Christmas Eve on Sesame Street, a special Sesame Street Christmas, Elmo Saves Christmas, or the Great Santa Claus Switch. I'm going to go with the second one. A special Sesame Street Christmas. Yes. No, you are no. incorrect. Which one is it? It is actually Elmo Saves Christmas. Really? Yeah, the the slight hint in there. Well, I guess if you knew the the special, maybe that would be a giveaway. Because I did each of these, I tried to have some, some sort of thing that like is a clue, clue to the yeah. plot, sort of. But Elmo Saves Christmas is this very bizarre special from 1999, which it's Steve Whitmire performing Kermit. That was okay. the keen ear would, or uh, Kurt okay. head might recognize that. But also, Elmo Saves Christmas is about... Elmo gets this like special magic wish, and so he wishes that it could be Christmas every day. Oh, okay, I did sense. Okay, and Santa tells him this is a bad idea, and he he sends him to the future to find out what happens. And like, and this excerpt is like this, is, like the very next day when suddenly it's Christmas again. But like, the consequences of it being Christmas every day include Big Bird is heartbroken because Snuffy went to see his family for Christmas, and a year later he still hasn't come back. Uh, okay, Christmas trees have become an endangered species. <laughs> And because businesses are closed on Christmas Day, they, that means all the businesses on Sesame Street have gone bankrupt. Oh, <laughs> so it's the interesting. It's the closest Sesame Street has ever gotten to like a dystopian future. <laughs> dystopian Sesame Street. So anyway, that that one is Mad Max Elmo. Interesting. All right, and I guess I will admit of the other specials, I mean, they are all Christmas specials, but. The Great Santa Claus Switch is not actually a Sesame Street Christmas special. Uh, okay. But it did mark the first appearance of Gonzo. So there you go. Weird. Okay. Yeah. But anyway. Okay. Um, Failure number one under my belt. <laughs> All right. Here, here's your next one. Okay. No telling what might happen. Now I'll have to go after him. Do you think you ought to, dear, with your cold and all? I have to go. Why, those three won't even get past the Miser Brothers without... The Miser Brothers? Oh, dear. Oh, I forgot all about those two. Okay, you see, okay. You see now. Like, yeah, I know this uh, one. Well, I'm trying to remember the title. That's the Rankin Bass. That's Santa Claus. He may have the gout at this point. Oh, but which one is it? Is it the Miser Brothers? Is this uh, Santa Claus coming to town? Not that one. No, it is not. Oh, drat. <laughs> I, get all, I get all these Rankin Bass ones mixed up. I am correct in that, correct? You are You are okay. on the right path. Okay. Yes. So, uh... Seems like we've come from this place before. I don't think so. No, Not we this one? no, we went. We came from Somber Town last. Oh, that's year. when Santa was becoming Santa. Right, we came from that one. But yeah, da, da, dum. What are some of the other ones' titles? 
This is where my lack of remembering titles is not playing me well. Okay, do you want a multiple choice? Yes, here? give me a multiple choice. I'll take a I'll take phone a friend. Okay. <laughs> is this Neil saves Christmas? <laughs> Santa Claus is coming to town. The life and adventures of Santa Claus. The year without a Santa Claus, or twas the night before Christmas. Drat, drat, drat. It's one or three, I think. Santa Claus coming. No, I just said that one. Right? Yeah. Give me the year without Santa. You are correct. All right. Yes. That is the year without Santa, which I think I need to watch. There's actually a number of these that are definitely ones that I probably saw on TV as a kid that yeah, I don't think where, I've seen since. That's where they sit in my head. Like I get them all mixed up. I get like Jack Frost and and well, they all be they're all kind of same style. So they're all kind of stuck in my head. Yeah. Together. Yeah, and I love to watch. Like Rudolph is the one that we had recorded on a mm-hmm. tape for a long time. But I like. I love to see some more of those stuff. I, I have a DVD of the of the Rudolph one. Cool. All right. Um. But but Let's go with this one. All right. You know, I. I can't think of anything I want. I guess. What I really wanted is. To be the biggest gift giver of all times. And in a way, I think I had that tonight. Although if I had my choice of any gift, any gift at all, I think I'd wish I could do this every year. Hmm. See, that's one of those quotes that, on one hand, sounds familiar. On the other hand, I'm like, I don't know if I've ever heard this before. (laughs) I'm not, I'm a little torn on whether I should have used this particular thing or not. Cause it's, I mean, it's towards the end of the special. I'll give you, yeah, I'll yeah. give you that. Well, hint. yeah, it gets, I mean, you get the sense that like he played Santa for a year and then he wants to be Santa sort of thing. And the music sounds, um, I'm going to give you another hint about this. Yeah. This is not technically actually a standalone episode or special. This is a special like Christmas episode of an ongoing show. Oh, so if you can name X-Files. the show, no. I'll I'll give it to you. <sighs> I don't got it. I'm pretty sure you are familiar with this episode. Wow. But I know there's not a lot of context clues in this. Yeah. Unless uh, it immediately rings a bell. Audience, if you know what it is, send me thoughts back in time to when we recorded this. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, Tim. Okay, I'll give you one more clue because oh, okay. I'm not. I don't know how to give you how to do a multiple. Yeah, that's fine. So yeah, you might have to just. Say this, eh. this is an episode of an anthology show, an anthology show like a Twilight Zone sort of thing. That's it. That's oh, right. nice. Okay, I've not seen that. You haven't? I, th- I don't think so. It's uh, it's an early. What's it called? The episode Night of the Meek. It's a story about a guy who was playing like a department store Santa and is kind of disillusioned. Then he gets like this magic bag that lets him like give okay. away gifts all night, and he loves it so much. He's like, man, I wish I could just do this forever. And so that's. That's basically his gift. He he winds up becoming the real Santa. See, it sits in that spot in my brain between, it sounds like I knew something about it, but I'm not sure I ever saw it. I I feel like, because we, we watched the Christmas Twilight Zone episode once. But that was the one with the toys in the barrel sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. and I guess I thought, remember we had talked about it, because I feel like I had seen it, and maybe Nathan or someone else that we watched yeah, had I, seen it. it. It feels like it's something that I had... I recognize knowing something about, but at least my brain doesn't remember seeing it. Okay. Well, this one. But that's a good one. Everyone should go watch it then. Okay. So let's see if maybe, I don't know, this one will be easier or not. We'll see. My lamb has been injured. You must save him. He is near death. Oh, lad, there is nothing I can do. But, but you are a king. A mortal king only. But there is a king among kings. Who would save your little friend? I don't know if you heard the beginning of that, but it, it, he was asking him to help his, his, his lamb. lamb. Yeah, his lamb. Yeah. So it's like, I mean, it's like something from like Drummer Boy, but it's not, I don't think it's that. The Little, little Drummer, Drummer Boy? Boy? Yeah. It is from it is. Little Drummer okay, Boy. Okay, okay. Yeah. It's been a long time since I've seen that one too, but like the context has felt very... You're talking about the, uh, the that is an also a Rankin yeah, and Bass. Yeah, exactly. Yes, yes. Yes. Okay, good. Okay. Good job. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, now, one of those has mixed in all my sort of like Rankin Bass, like seven-year-old yeah. memories. It's, it's, it's one of those very vaguely there somewhere. Yeah. Um, but and heard about the lamb and the king and he can help and I'm like, that sounds like Drummer Boy. Yeah. Good job. Okay. Good job. All right. Where's the veggie tails? <laughs> <laughs> all right. We'll do this one next. What is all this? They're Christmas toys. 
Waiting for you? <laughs> for me? Well, what have they got to do with me? You are going to give them to your children. There, there must be a mistake. We have no children. You do now. You have all the children of the world. But how could I deliver all these toys? I won't live long enough for that. Both of you will live forever. Like us. Wow. That's almost like the other Twilight Zone one as far as context. <laughs> um, and that one actually doesn't ring any bells. Doesn't ring any bells Doesn't ring all. any bells, no. I, guess, I probably didn't include enough context. This one, I guess, was more for me than anything. Because it is, <laughs> is this one that you use? Have you ever seen the Santa Claus the movie with John Lithgow? That is this movie. That's this movie? Yes. Oh, man. I haven't seen that one for ages. Yeah, see, I feel I, like this is one I saw I that show. in the background one time like when I was really little. But like, I don't have a lot of memory of it, except for this one year when I got sick like on December 23rd. And okay. and I was like bedridden for like the evening. And it's like, well, let's see if I can find something Christmassy on Netflix to cheer me up. And I watched like the beginning part of this. And then uh, and I was like, that's good enough. I think that was because like beginning is kind of cool. Like the origins of Santa, mm -hmm. uh, how he like he has he's his chosen one of prophecy. And then like later on, it's like Santa. Wait, I think we're talking different. I What I said, what, are you talking the? This is the same movie. Remind me which movie you're talking about. Santa Claus, the movie with John Lithgow. With John Lithgow, with the with the like exploding candy canes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. It it starts off showing his origin story, so he, and then later it goes to like 1980. Because okay, I haven't seen it forever. My main memories of this are two things. One, when Dudley Moore's the elf, uh -huh. and the whole thing falls apart like that. The whole like conveyor belt toy making thing. Okay. That's like stuck in my burned in my memory, and at the end, where like. The candy canes are exploding. Like everything else I've forgotten from the movie, but like those two things. And John Lithgow being like, isn't that what he's, I don't know? There's he, something. He's like an evil business yeah. that's trying to replace Santa. Or I something. would love to actually see that movie again someday because I remember really liking it. I would be as a kid. I'm, I'm curious about it. It doesn't have great reviews on Rotten Tomatoes. And it's one of those that like is always kind of like on the fringes of people's memories. So which kind of tells me it's, it may not be that great, but it does like, leave an impression as a uh, if seeing it's it as a kid. Yeah, yeah exactly. It, I saw it as a kid and it stuck in my head and it has a certain atmosphere. And yeah, I'd really hunt that down. At and that opening is kind of cool, this idea of like Oh he's like he walks over the okay, I'm I'm remembering this slowly. He's because he's like a, a woodcutter or something and like yeah. the elves find him and bring him in it's like we have been waiting for you. You you are the chosen or you're, something like that. You're right. Okay. It's kind of like the Santa Claus as the man of prophecy or something. Well, because it's just funny because, like, they always say that memory, everything's in your head, but you need to make connections. And, like, these are starting to rebuild my connections for it. I'm like, oh, yeah. Yeah. It's, that's, that's one of the interesting things about Christmas specials. They they kind of lodge in there sometimes. And so, okay, this next one, I don't know. You may not know this at all. And this was just a shot in the dark because, like, I wasn't familiar with it. But it's just, just here. It, and it's kind of interesting. These are fun, so. Okay. Tell me what happens to Christmas toys. After Christmas, that is. Why, uh, why... You will take a few months. Why, I guess toys wear out, I guess. Well, your little sister breaks them. Little brothers break toys, too. <laughs> ah, but no more. Behold, the modern miracle, gloopsticity. Little brother-proof, little sister-proof. Gloopstick, guaranteed. Not for just a month after Christmas, not for just a year after Christmas, but forever after Christmas. Yeah, I don't know, but okay. I, it's, it's funny because it's kind of, it's like this it's kind of slick guy selling stuff, and, but we have this very epic music in the background, like it's a very <laughs> interesting combination out of context. Yeah. No, I I don't. If you have no it, some no. sort of cartoony sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Good, good guess there. It is. Uh, it is a animated Raggedy Ann and Andy oh. thing called the Great Santa Claus Caper. Interesting. And it's kind of funny. It's directed by Chuck Jones, a uh, big Looney big Tunes. Yeah, and yeah. the the. The like slick guy you heard is this character who looks very much similar to like Wiley e. Coyote, <laughs> particularly when he's like doing you know Wiley e. Coyote, super genius. <laughs> 
is very much the same character in just that's a hilarious. Raggedy Ann and Andy. And Interesting. It's a story that's similar to like Toy Story 2 about like this guy who wants to preserve Christmas toys and like this goop stuff that will like preserve them forever, but you can't actually play with them. Okay. So early Toy Story 2. Yeah, <laughs> kind of. So anyway, like I said, that was a shot that's in the a, dark. No, that was fun one. I, I have memories of watching some Raggedy Ann and Andy once upon a time. But that's all I have. If you heard random thing, I don't think I've ever mentioned the podcast. Did you ever hear of a cartoon called Super Ted? Super Ted? I th- and his friend Spotty Man or something like that? Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. I'm not so very I'm vague, not sure. Very vague recollection. But it's like this teddy bear that would come alive. But he had also like this friend guy who was like this. He was like yellow, but he had like orange spots on him. And Huh. Yeah. Anyways. No, I don't know. It was a Saturday morning cartoon sort of thing? Or it was a movie? Know. I think it's just something we got from the movie store back, like way back uh, when, or you know, VHS sort of stuff. You know, see, that, that's the interesting thing that it's hard to do nowadays, or like it's harder to just stumble across random stuff because, yeah. like, we were again, we're afraid of the present. We yep. want to, we want to know what we're getting into, and it's back when, like, all you had available to you is what the video store just, happened to have. We'll just pick this, and it might not even be great. You just it's what you got, and it's better than nothing. And sometimes it's an adventure that way. Yeah. So anyway, so right. one one last. Okay, here we go. One last about 50-50. Where'd he go? I don't know. He just disappeared. He couldn't have jumped and lived. Maybe he flew. This would be a good place for Santa to come and get him. The moon is full. And it is Christmas Eve. Listen. Maybe you'll hear his bells. That's interesting. It doesn't ring a bell, but the voices sound very familiar. Either from this or they're just that sort of voice that you hear in these sorts of things. Uh huh. But very different style than a lot of these other clips have been mm-hmm. playing for you. Yeah. A little more. I don't know, somber is not quite the right word, but earthy, I guess. Earthy, yeah. I don't know. Okay, I'll give you a, I'll give you a hint. So this is from a movie. Okay, came out in nineteen eighty nine. Eighty nine, Five O Goes Christmas. <laughs> um, I don't know. All right, so, I, I'm gonna kick myself when I hear it. But. Okay, well, I will. I'll I'll see if I can give you a multiple choice here, real quick. All right, is this from All I Want for Christmas, Home for the Holidays? The Preacher's Wife, or Prancer? For no reason at all, except for some reason I stuck to it. Let's go with Prancer. Prancer is correct. All right. Good job. So yeah, that's Sam Elliott is the the, okay. the male voice you hear in that, which Sam Elliott has a very distinctive, yes. gruff yes. kind of sounding voice. But I don't think I've seen Prancer. Have you seen it? One time, and it's actually kind of memorable because I remember Prancer came out the same day as The Little Mermaid. Okay. And for some reason, someone from our church at the time was going to take me and some other kids to see The Little Mermaid. And I guess something happened. The times got mixed up or we were late or something. And basically, we missed The Little Mermaid. So we wound up going to see Prancer instead. And I remember at the time, I must have been like six. I actually was kind of grateful because I, I had seen the commercials <laughs> for The Little Mermaid and wasn't sure I could handle Ursula. Yeah. And it was probably for the best because, yeah, I still don't I still don't like that movie. <laughs> <laughs> Ursula gives me the, the creeps. But I remember at the time, like, so I was like, okay, I'm fine with seeing this instead. And kind of liking it, but also kind of I realized like, eh, okay, it was okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that's like, one reason, like, in, like, Home Alone came out the next year. And oh, and everyone kind of completely forgot about Prancer after yeah, that. So. That makes sense. So well, anyway, that was a good collection. Well, thank you. Glad you had fun. You were able. You said, like you said, about fifty fifty. Yeah, I kind of got you to some, but it's yeah, it's interesting how uh, stories affect our memories, especially Christmas specials. Exactly. Yeah, a lot of them just lodge. Even bad ones lodge in your head. All right, so we got one last segment for you all today. We've been kind of touching on these more somber stories. This feels like a good fit for a bit of story.
Okay, next. So you have a flash fiction you wish to share with us I today? have a flash fiction we decided that uh, we're going to go with today. Kind of a Christmassy one. We've used up a lot of our Christmassy ones in previous Christmas episodes. Go watch or listen to... Uh, There's one about silence. Yeah, I that was a really... The, that, we did like three or, three of them in that time, I think. Three or four. Yeah. yeah. So, um, but let's go ahead and hear this one and then we'll t- maybe talk about it. What's, yep. what's it called? It is called The Lost Closet. Walter sat on the edge of his bed and watched the snow drifting down outside his window. He'd have to go out in it soon. His costume was laid out beside him, waiting for him. He had seen the door when he pulled the hanger out of the closet. He decided to go look at it again. In the back of the closet was a door, hidden from the casual observer. Walter had not been in there for some time. There was no reason to be. But now he pushed the clothes aside and opened it, pushing the door in and entering. It was a larger room than one would expect from the outside. Walter had never seen another like it, but he knew, from his many years, that most people had a place like this. A private space no one knew of but themselves. A room where lost and broken things collected. There was a mirror in Walter's room, full length, where he saw himself as he had been decades earlier. There were half-completed manuscripts on a shelf, and another shelf of books he had meant to read. Pictures of old girlfriends hung in one corner, faded and warped. Pushpins displayed travel brochures on a cork board. A few lottery tickets were posted as well. Walter stood for a long time, absorbing his surroundings, aching. He had almost forgotten he had once wanted to be a police officer, until he saw the badge on a small table, alongside pictures of the neighborhood as it had been when he was a young father raising his kids. He turned on the record player and set down the needle. Music filled the room, snatches of piano music he had wanted to teach himself. Some time later, he returned from his reverie. The room was filled with the smell of freshly mowed grass and sunlight, of days sweating shirtless as a child who found the world perfectly happy. There was a box on the floor stuffed with transcriptions of mistakes he had made as a parent, things he had said and hadn't said. He pressed them down and began to pile the books in. Then came the posters and the records and the pictures, the scrapbooks of things that never were and the photo albums of things that could never be. He forced them in, everything, even the mirror, and tried to pick up the box. He was afraid he wouldn't be able to carry it. It weighed nothing at all. He closed the door to this secret room, poured the contents of the box into a smaller, decorative one which sat on his bed beside his costume. It barely fit, but he managed to press the lid on. Then he pulled the robe on over his head. That evening, Walter stood in silence, with Christmas hymns playing softly, as the visitors to the live nativity shuffled in and out in hushed tones. He stood beside two others dressed in extravagant robes. He was Balthazar tonight, and he held the gift of myrrh, the embalming oil, before the child who would make all things new. Well, that was nice. (laughs) <laughs> I don't know what is that. You don't have anything to add to that? Uh, I could. I'm not sure I want to explain necessarily. But I think most people have had times of life where you're like talking about time and Christmas and nostalgia. And we're like all those things that could have been or should have been or once upon a time you wanted. And I think it is worth not living in those or storing them away, but to uh, to give them up. To the one who will make all things new one day and anything that you desired that never happened in this life, I'm pretty sure he can fulfill that later on. So that's that's sort of my pensive Christmas story for the night. Yeah. Walter, giving him the name Walter, you're kind of implying that he's an older gentleman. Yeah, he's had kids and things. And so, you know, there's just a whole life behind him that's like... There's things, you know, even now, being only 41, that you look back like, I used to want to do that. And I never did. And should I have spent my time doing that instead of this other thing? Yeah. Um, that sort of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I certainly feel that I'm just a few years younger than you. But yeah, mid, late 30s. Yeah. <laughs> I'm feeling the late th- and seeing the late when I look at pictures like, yeah, I'm more late 30s than <laughs> than uh, early 20s, like what I used to look like. Oh, and podcasting, it doesn't come through. <laughs> That's true. I'm still as young as ever. 
But yeah, you you do kind of look back and see it's like, well, I guess I didn't wind up these things that I thought I would wind up being haven't wound up so far. Doesn't mean some of them never will. But, exactly. But yeah, it's it's good to leave those in the hands of someone that knows it knows better than we do. Knows better than we do. Exactly. And time is we have been pulling out Lewis and stuff. What the the first seven the seventy years of your life here is like the stumble on the beach before walking onto the island. Have you heard that one? This sounds like Lewis. Yeah. <laughs> even if I don't recognize that yeah, one. Exactly. Yeah, he has a very distinct way of doing his his analogies and imagery. Yep, it's true. Well, we hope, folks, that you have enjoyed this moment of time with us. Well, all these moments, the silly, the thoughtful, the serene, and the ridiculous. Yes. We, we like to give you a variety of moments here on Dear Old Trains of Thought. If you have enjoyed this, I hope you will uh, reach out to us, leave us a comment at derailedtrainsofthought.blogspot.com, um, or leave us a review on your podcatcher of choice, probably Apple Podcasts or maybe Stitcher or Spotify. And share it with your friends. And share it. Yeah, share it around. Let us know what you would like to see more of or, or what's your favorite part of what's a segment that we don't do often enough or a segment that you are tired of or <laughs> or one that uh, you're always happy to hear again. Yes. Let or us- something you've never heard that us do and you're like, why don't you do this? And we'll be like, I don't know. That's a good question. So those are all great places to leave us a comment or a review, or you can email us at derailedtrains at gmail.com and also visit our old school website, derailedtrainsofthought.blogspot.com. Awesome. I guess it's time for my soundtrack. Yes. You got another 90s arcade song here? I do not. Oh, that's probably good. (laughs) I actually uh, picked out something that's kind of Christmassy from OC Remix. Remix from a game I'm not familiar with at all. Um, not very Christmassy necessarily. It's called Dot Hack Infection Part One. This sounds super Christmassy. Yeah, not really. It's kind of a cyber sword art online kind of kind of game, from what I understand. But this remix is called Stockings by the Fire, which I think kind of evokes the kind of Kairos moments mm-hmm. of just kind of chilling by the fire. Well, maybe not chilling, maybe warming up by the fire, <laughs> being cozy. But this song is remixed by Ryan Davis Music, and it's some nice atmospheric bluegrass, so I hope you'll enjoy it. Meanwhile, Nick, we've got some more of these islands and yeah. this archipelago to visit. Yeah, just let's keep looking around. There's a lot of interesting things here. I, I understand we there's a baby that's missing, so oh. we, we got that we may need to help track down. Okay, well then, that sounds good. So it sounds like we got our work cut out for us. Well, everyone have a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Indeed. Until uh, next time, 2022. Wow. I, I'm not going to tip fate and say, let's see what happens. But. <laughs> But we, Bring it on. <laughs> but we hope that you will join us for more podcasting adventures next year. Until then, this is Tim. This is Nick. Bye-bye. <laughs>